Okay, so I'm recording right now. Um, and uh, I lost the chat. Um, and somebody is asking, are we doing regrade? Yes, yes, and I apologize. I have a backlog of regrades. Um, and um, there's something always new just to, to, to basically too many and I couldn't uh, deal with, I mean, catch up with them. So I'm, I still owe you some quite delayed regrades um, and they will take priority over regrades on test three. Uh, that are still coming. All right, so let's get uh, back into counting. And uh, so we have, um, oh wait, let's see, let's see how far we get, right? Um, so, um, so counting subsets. And here's a beautiful application of the K to one rule, right? Like, so sometimes these K to one, one to one, uh, bijection uh, rules, they feel like, well, uh, kind of abstract, Maybe I can count in a simpler way, uh, you know, and, and here is a beautiful application of it where uh, it's clear that, that that's a really convincing way to count. Okay, excuse me, okay. So here are two different problem types. Uh, you, you have, a, a, say a student council who has 15 people, and you have to elect four of them as officers, and these, uh, but these are different offices. There is a president, a VP, treasurer, secretary. So basically the four permutations that you're selecting, you're selecting four elements, you have the set of 15, uh, right? 15 different names. You're selecting four of them and you select them in an ordered way because the first one is the president, the second VP, the third treasurer, the fourth secretary. So it's a four permutation uh, because the outcome, the selection is a sequence, right? When I uh, denote an, uh, this tuple as a result of selection, it's clear that I should read this tuple as an ordered one. Sally is the president, Frank, VP, Margaret, George, George, secretary. And a changing of the order would mean a different selection, right? Different or different, different selection of the officers. Uh, but let's say I select not uh, this office, but just some committee. And the only thing about this committee is who's on it and who's not. So now I'm selecting a four tuple again, uh, but it's an unordered tuple, right? Because if my selection is Sally, Frank, Margaret, George as before, it doesn't matter what order I put them because each, both this one and this one means the same thing, that the same set of four is chosen as an executive committee. So, the order does not matter uh, now. So this is called a, a combination rather than a permutation. And um, um, so here is another um, example. You have a three element set and I can list all two permutations of this set. Two permutation again is a is a sequence of two elements and it's a sequence so it's ordered such that each element in the sequence is an element of the set and there is no repetitions right so i cannot do a and a twice right so like in this example here it would make sense to choose sally twice right because they're the same person that cannot be both the president and the vp uh, so these are all two permutations of the set, right? So this is the, there's six possible sequences of length two whose elements are in the set and there is no repetitions within uh, each every sequence. Uh, now, 
the set of all two subsets, right? So if I think of these as not ordered, but as sets, uh, then this is the only uh, set of possibilities, right? So these are the only subsets of set S would have two elements. And by the way, I don't have to add no repetitions because we all know by the word subset, right? Like that it doesn't make sense to write, for example, here, A comma A, right? Because a set, uh, a subset whose elements are A and then A again, is just a subset whose only element is A. So it wouldn't be a subset of two elements. For sequences, that's not the case. A comma A is a valid sequence. So I have to add in this case that I admitted no repetitions. Whereas in this case, it's basically subsumed, implied by the fact that what I'm creating here are sets of two elements. So the number of uh, these ordered tuples of length two is the number of two permutations. So it's, it's basically three, six, right? Because it's three ways to choose the first one, A, B, C. And for each choice of the first one, I have two ways to uh, choose the second one, right? So here is B and C if I chose A, here is A and C if I chose B, and here is A and B if I chose C, right? So in every case, it's always two. And so the total number is six. And how many of these? Well, of course, here I can see that it's three, right? But well, well, what's, how do you count this in general? Well, here is a way of counting which basically relates the concept of the permutations to the concept of subsets. And it allows you to count these by counting these first and then uh, applying a certain K to one rule. Okay, so in general, okay, so well, it's still not super generally, I still have this particular uh, ex example. Let's say take a set of five elements, blue, green, orange, pink, red. How many ways are there to pick a subset of three colors from, from this? So in other words, how to count? Uh, okay, th th three element subset. Now we know how to count three element permutations, right? We did this last time. It's five factorial divided by two factorial because it's five minus three. Or if you just uh, rewrite it differently, it's five times four times three, and that's where I stop. I count, I do three multiplications because I have three colors. So it's n times n minus one times n minus two, da, 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 n minus whatever this number is. Okay, so I know how to count them. And now let's consider a certain function which maps these two sets. Uh, this one, the two permutations, and two subsets, but it makes it general for any K here and for any uh, set X, right? Well, I'm still using three, right? But this is going to generalize. Uh, think of this as K. So, uh, my function is very simple. I take any sequence here. So the three permutations I know how to count, right? That's what we, I was arguing here before. And for every three permutation, I assign to it a certain three element subset. And what is the subset? It's, it's trivial. It's just, it's a subset that contains everybody who is in the sequence. So for example, if I apply this function f to a sequence blue, pink, green, I get a subset blue, green, pink, and now ordered now so that not to get confused by order of letters, right? So there is a unique way of writing this for me, right? So that I don't have uh, confusion as to like which set I need, whether I have counted the set already or I haven't. And if I have a different sequence, uh, it contains the same elements, but it's a different sequence because it's, it's, it's the same elements, but in a different order. 
Well, it maps to the same set, all right? In general, it, uh, this function uh, that takes a particular sequence and creates a set that has all the elements of the sequence. It is a, a function which is k to one, where k is equal to three factorial here. Okay. Uh, so if these are R element subsets, R element permutations and R element subsets, this would be R factorial. And um, here it's why it is, right? So what's three factorial? It's six. And uh, these are, for example, all the sequences which would get mapped to the same set, BPG. Okay, these three colors. And uh, why are there three factorial? Because there are three factorial ways of computing the pre image of this function. In other words, you have a set of uh, three elements. And how do you compute this pre image? Well, list all the permutations of this elements in the set. Right? Treat them as a sequence. And how many permutations of it are there? Three factorial. So this will be R factorial if this had R elements. Right? And uh, this function is regular. It's k to one, where k is equal to r factorial, where r is this how many, how long the sequences are, and how um, how big the subsets are. Right? It is regular because why is it the k to one function? Well, it's a function. Uh, right, so what, what's, what does it mean that this function is k to one? It means that for every image, first of all, everything in the image set is covered. So it's an onto function, right? Every subset has some sequence which is mapped to it. But the well, that's obvious. I take the subset and I make a sequence out of it. That sequence will be in the pre-image. But more is true, it is k regular in that the number of these pre images of every value, the size of the pre image set is the same. It's r factorial, right? Or r is the number of elements here, three in this case. So it is a k to one function. Uh, this, this, this picture shows that. And um, if, if there is questions, you know, just ask. So, um, so now you can conclude, because it's a k to one function, that the size of this green thing, in other words, the number of three element subsets of set S, must be the same as the number of this red thing. So that's the number of the three element permutations of element from set S divided by uh, this K, right? Which is the R factorial. Uh, and this is the K to one rule application, right? Um, so in other words, uh, I start with a set of N elements and I want to count mm, how many R element subsets of, the, of it there are. Well, I create this uh, function that assigns R permutations to R subsets. This function is k to one, where k is R factorial. And now I can count the number of subsets. It's the number of permutations divided by the k. And so it is uh, number of permutations of n elements, R, R sequences in an n element set divided by R factorial. This number is n factorial over n minus r factorial. So totally, I come up with this. And uh, this term has a special symbol. It's a, it's a symbol, uh, it, it's this symbol. It's read n choose r. 
okay and um, when you write this you i will interpret this as this as this right as the, that's the definition of a of an of a um, n choose r uh, so conclusion uh, this is the number of r element subsets of n element set and we have a special notation for this it's called n choose r or you can also write like this it's a number of combinations r element combinations in n element set uh, so that notation is somewhat similar to the number of per, you know the way we denote permutations right uh, the equivalent and and this is less standard so this is everybody knows that and and that when you write uh, some people will not know what what that was you have to define this and recall uh yeah but i will know when you write that on the test um so again this is a formula for um for n choose r um and 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 um so what's six choose two okay what's the number of two element subsets in a six elements uh, set where is six factorial divided by two factorial times four factorial right so basically you know if this six factorial right is the multiplication of one two three four five six uh dividing by this means that you kick out one two three four so only five times six remains and then you can divide by two factorial which is simply two so 15 is the answer now what did you do six choose four right so this was a number of two element subsets in a set of six and this will be an element of four element subsets in a, a set of six uh, but um, you will see that right like so in if i have r here and now n minus r is two so this expression and this expression is obviously the same right and by the way that was not a coincidence right so it's always going to be when uh, this thing is n minus r okay we'll return to this on the next slide so let's first do okay what's 500 choose 500 okay so uh, look if you plug in the formula zero factorial is a one okay so it's like how many ways are there to permute an empty sequence empty sequence right um so it's a one and and it's intuitive that it is so let's say okay how many five and 500 element subsets are there of a 500 element set only one the whole set right so there is a unique subset that has all the elements and it's the original set what about uh, this right so uh, well that also has a uh, simple formula right it would just be 500 and uh, does it agree with our notion of what we introduced this as so how many one element subsets of a 500 element sets are there right so well it's just how many elements of the set right because one element subsets are just each of one element subset contains just a single element so how many single elements are there in a 500 uh, element set 500 okay so this uh, equality that we observed that six choose two and six choose four right in this such example was the same is a general rule and you can choose it by arithmetics we can check this right so n over four n choose four is has this formula and n choose n minus r you plug it in you get this however n minus n minus r simplifies to r and um, now this and that are the same so you can write the quality uh, okay so a simple check however there is a it's like a more fundamental thing and it's a one-to-one -one rule 
So you can also see that these two things must be the same by the definition of what they are. So this thing on the left was supposed to be the number of R element subsets in an N element set. So let's take a set of N elements, one, two, three, four, zero, N, and consider a set of all R element subsets of it. On the right hand side, we'll have a set of N minus R elements of it, right? So this quantity is supposed to be the cardinality of a set of N minus R element, uh, size subsets of, uh, of this set. So, but I will show you very simple function between the, the, the set whose cardinality is expressed by the left-hand side, which is the set of R elements subsets of S, and the set whose cardinality is expressed on the right-hand side, which is the set of n minus r element subsets. And moreover, this function is a bijection, which would imply that this set and this set must have the same cardinality. And therefore, this left-hand side and the right-hand side must be equal. OK, so let's see. This function is this one. To every r element subset, I can assign an n minus r element subset by taking the initial set and, and looking at its complement in set S, right? So a complement is a complement of a, which is some subset of these, within this set S. Now, clearly, it is a bijection. First of all, do I map correctly from this set to this? Yes, because every A here has R, R elements. So its complement must have N minus R elements. Okay. So it's correctly defined a function from this uh, domain to this range. Now, is it a bijection? Okay. So uh, could I have a collision in this function? So can two different subsets have the same complement. Okay, you can see this immediately no, right? So if the subsets were different, th their complements cannot be the same, right? All right, so it doesn't have collisions. So, but is it onto, all right? So is every N minus R element subset an image uh, of this function from some R element? Yes. Because uh, what's the inverse function? Okay, speak up. What's the inverse function to this? Who can say? How is the inverse function, function just exactly the same? Yes, it's exactly the same, right? So the inverse of the function is, is the same function, and you can test that, right? Apply it twice. So what do you do? You take an x. The first application creates a complement. And of x, and then you take this function again. What does it mean? You complement that, but complement of a complement is the set itself, right? So, so that function is an inverse of itself. So it is a bijection, and uh, and the rest follows, right? So I'm just repeating myself, right? So the left hand side is, is the number of ways to count this thing, and the right hand side is the number of ways to count this thing. So therefore, they must be equal because this function is a bijection. Okay. Um, okay. So let's do some examples. Um, subsets versus permutations. Okay. So, so you say you have hundred pianists, and um, the first round of a competition, you select twenty-five of them to go to the next round. How many possibilities of this outcome you have? Right? So the big thing is, is this an ordered or an unordered selection? Are you selecting a sequence or are you selecting a subset? And it's a subset, right? Because uh, 
there is nothing in this process that says that there is some sort of difference between the first person selected and the 25th person. No, you just select a subset of 25. So, uh, so that's the, so the answer is 100 to 25, right? It's the, the number of 25 element subsets of a 100 element set. But if the question says, okay, so let's say that, that uh, now it's the second round of uh, competition and we have 25 pianists, okay, so smaller set, but that's not the essential difference. The essential difference is that now we are not selecting a subset. We are selecting five winners of the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth prize. So now we are choosing uh, in an ordered way, right? We are selecting a sequence. Now it's a sequence because the first position corresponds to first prize, second to second, etc. So now positions have semantics, they're meaningful. And moreover, it's a five permutation because there cannot be repeats. It would make no sense to select the same person as winning both the first and second prize, right, in the same competition. So, so it is a R element sequence of an N element set for this, right? So it's um, this is the answer, right? So you, and if you compute it, right, this is twenty five factorial over twenty factorial, and and this is um, yeah, we have the formula for that. Uh, okay. So let, let's do more of such of such examples. Um, what do we know so far? So um, we try to give this um, unified um, approach to counting problems as that there is some selection process, some procedure that picks elements according to some rules. Right, like it, it picks either set or a sequence or or some other object. Okay, and you have to understand is this object uh, ordered, unordered? Does it have repeats? Does it kind of not have repeats, etc. And and we have identified some uh, some ways to approaching this this counting how many outcomes are the of processes so for example if a process basically makes a fork which is either this way and to say five uh, element five character passwords or go to the right and and in the right hand you have six element passwords and there is no uh, they both they're in the they're separate processes now it's either this one or this one that's a sum rule you just count everybody in one tree and everybody in the right and you add. But perhaps the right way to look at the process is really that first you choose something and then in some way independent of the above, you choose the next. And for every choice on the first level, there was the same number of choices on the next level. Perhaps they're not identical choices, like for example, if I choose permutations, right, if I if mm, A is my first element, then the, all the others are chosen from everything but A. And if B is my first element, then all the others are chosen from everything but except of B, right, etc. But yet the numbers are the same. Um, it's simply everybody but the one who was chosen first. And um, if I can structure my process this way, then it's a product rule. It's the number of these first step choices times the number of next step choices, right? And then within this, we saw that, okay, if you're choosing sequences which are ordered, but repeats within a sequence are okay. Like for example, choose, uh, you know, an N uh, bit string, and clearly some bits can be the same, right? Or how many N character words are there in the English, uh, you know, if you can form using English letters, English alphabet letters, uh, well, I can reuse the same letter, right? So, 
um, so this is simply cardinality of the of the alphabet to the how long sequences right you choosing now if this is as above but there's no no repeats are possible then this is called r permutation right it's an ordered choice sequence of uh, r elements um sorry here i have n here i have r and um and 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 this is what's the formula and now if you're choosing subsets so unordered uh and again without repeats uh well this was the formula right it's the end uh, cardinal of a choose r so these are the rules we know okay let's let's uh, you know hit some problems with with those right so okay uh, how many binary strings not, uh, of length nine have exactly four ones? So you're choosing a bit string, and well, you wouldn't think like you know I I I'm choosing a bit string right, but like if I chose a one, then the remaining must I have basically a budget of three ones, so or I can choose a zero, then I still have a budget of four ones. If you start drawing like a tree like this, it will be very hairy. It will be very complex and uh, it will be imbalanced. It will have different sizes of, 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 uh, of the subtrees will have different sizes. It will be hard to count. So maybe there is a completely different way of counting these that is not thinking of this as, you know, the, to sort of the standard way which is like okay start choosing these bits and then you have this kind of dynamic constraint okay so here is this very simple way to think of this right which just eliminate all these problems um just identify just choice of such bit string with the choice of four indices between one and nine Right, so you have four indices, nine indices. This is how many bits you have, and you just choose which of these are gonna get a one. There has to be exactly four, and no more. And once you choose these four, let's say, you know, right, these these four, that's it. There's no further choices. These guys get ones, and all the others get zero. So the number of such bit strings is the same as the number of four element sets in a set of nine indices. And it's going to be funny that like these are unordered, but they're unordered because the only thing is that matters is which of these nine or which four of these nine I choose, not the order in which I choose them. It doesn't matter that this guy got the first bit one and this guy got the second bit one right because these are the same bit one so that doesn't matter right so it's a set it's a four element subset of a nine element set and if you want to be more formally you know then you can see oh this is actually a bijection rule happening right so i can identify nine bit strings with exactly four ones with four element subsets of the set of indices. And uh, what's the identification? It's a bijection. And uh, this identification is very simple. Given a four element subset here, it is defined a string uh, because like this, if some index is in the subset, so let's call this subset A, it has four elements and they're all from here. So a given index can be either in the subset or not. If it is, then the corresponding bit of the string is one. And if it's not, then the bit is uh, zero, right? So let's say I chose indices one, three, four, nine. Well, that would be the bit string, right? At exactly position one, three, four, and nine, it has one, zero everywhere. And it's a bijection because I can invert it, right? I mean, just put any bit string that has exactly four ones, and just the inversion will be rid of what the indices are and it's the second the fifth the sixth i mean second fifth sixth and eighth okay this is 
I messed that one up, right? Oh, no, 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 sure. This is a ninth index now, so that's okay. Okay. Um, okay. So it's a bijection, and therefore the cardinality of this set, all possible nine bit strings with four ones, is the same as the cardinality of this set, a set of four element subsets of S, and we already know how to count that one. And so now we know how to count this one. Okay. Uh, okay, let's take other, 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 you know, uh, counting over larger alphabets. Okay, so decimals. So you have uh, 10 digits and ask how many strings of length eight are there? Well, it's 10 to the eight, right? Uh, I have, I'm making eight choices of digits. Each digit chosen independently from this set. So it's 10 to the eight, right? It's the number of all eight digit uh, um, um, which is yeah which is by the way not identical with the number of eight digit uh, decimal integers right because they have leading zeros okay these things count as zero zero zeros da 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 as uh, uh, as a um, as a string um, okay, um, so what about if I want to count all the eight character strings, but uh, with a similar constraint to the one I had on the previous slide? So, say exactly three of them are five. Well, so let's try to use, so now it will be a slightly more complex, but let's try to use the same methodology, right? So, um, let's pick these three places so therefore basically a choice of this this of this decimal string of length eight is a choice of the places where the fives go so there has to be three of them right and um and and once i chose these three places then the difference is that unlike the binary case where i chose three places where the ones go all the others are determined well because i have a decimal alphabet so now the others are not yet determined right so i choose three of these eight positions where fives go but now i still have choices i have to choose the remaining five digits yeah why five because i have eight uh, digits to choose, right? Three of them are going to be fives. What are the remaining uh, digits, positions, right? Is five remaining positions. And how do I fill them up? Well, with any digit except five, right? Because if I chose any of the remaining digits as uh, this, then I would violate this constraint. Right, because I already chose three places where the fives go, so I cannot put the five in any other place. But that's great. You see, this process, the first process in the fork of decisions, choose the three positions where I will place, which I will occupy with this fixed digit five, is independent from the next one, which fills out the remaining ones. Well, it is dependent in that in that if i choose the first three indices well the, the choices that determine this right will determine the digit the fourth fifth sixth seventh and eighth digit and if i choose the last guys to have fives then the choices in this part will choose the first five digits but it really doesn't matter right because I don't have to think like which digit they are. I can order them from left to right, and whichever five digits remain, it's the same process that is going to assign, uh, you know, bits, uh, digits from this reduced alphabet to these five places. So these two processes are independent, at least as far as the counting of their goals, right? So it's the product rule. 
uh, that would tell you how many uh, overall ways of choosing that thing is. So now I uh, how many of these subsets of three in an, right? So how many ways are there to choose these three positions out of eight? It's eight to three. How many ways to choose the remaining digits is nine to the five because I have a reduced element, uh, a reduced alphabet, right? I can choose any digit except of this one, right, by this constraint. And by the product rule, it's just the product of these two, right? By the way, you can reverse these two processes. So I know that I, uh, I can uh, choose the five digits freely. And each of them is independent. There could be repeats, right? There could be 0, 0, 0, 0 on them, or it could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Yes? So this process could be done first, and only later I can now, given that I chose these five, I choose the three positions where the fives will go, right? These two processes are independent. They can be done in any order, and it would not change the result. Yes. Um, so now that I'm talking through this example, I see that I have the unfortunate choice of co uh, constants here. So I would maybe modify this on the slides at least I post and then use some other time that uh, this five here is the same as this one, right? And that's a coincidence. It's, it's this five is because of eight minus three is equal to five. So. So it would be better if I chose a different constant here. And it wouldn't change anything, right? So if I have here four, I would have here four, and nothing else, would, oh, okay, and here I would have four, right? And nothing else would change. None of these numbers, uh, which is what, what matters. All right. Uh, uh, what uh, if uh, the conditions are, I've been choosing a five digit string that has exactly three fives and two ones. Okay, so now this string is very constrained, right? I'm choosing the three positions where the three fives go. And unlike the previous example, I actually don't have any more choices because it's only five digits to begin with. Once I chose the places where the fives go, there is no more choice. All these other ones are just ones. Yes. Uh, wait, I messed up the slide. Hold on. What is the, hold on a second. Uh, choose the three out of eight positions. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, let me just uh, change this right away because uh, is, when I was reading this, I knew there's something off. Okay, right, good. Um, so from the current slide, good. Okay, so it's the same as before. Where am I? Okay, it's the same as before. So, um, uh, uh, hold on. Do, do you guys still see the the, screen, the the same presentation? No, we don't see the PowerPoint. Oh, okay, okay. And now? Yes, we do. Okay, great, great, great. Uh, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. So, uh, just as in this case, I I'm, I have an eight eight long. A string. And in this case, I was choosing three positions for fives. And now I have also eight long string. And I'm also choosing three positions for fives, but now I'm also choosing, I have one more constraint. There also have to be two, exactly two ones. Okay, so I, I basically, I structured this as a process, as a product rule of three processes. Uh, um, uh, oh, uh, homework eight not posted to grade scope. Sure, I will post it right now. Okay. Um, and um, so, 
Um, okay, so I choose positions for fives. Um, then I choose position for ones from the remaining. So now I have uh, out of the eight long string, three positions are occupied by five. So I have five positions more somewhere. Yes, five more positions. Two of them are choose to be ones. I am left with the three positions to fill up. And now these are chosen from the reduced set because I cannot rem uh, repeat the five or I will have more than three fives. And I cannot repeat the one because I will have more than two ones. Okay, so uh, all of these I know how to do, all right? So now it is a three element string from this reduced set. So it's eight to the three. And I choose two positions for ones out of five. And yes, so this is the, the you know the modified formula. Now, now you can clearly see that I can rearrange this process. And in fact, so who told me to first choose places for fives? I can first choose uh, two places out of eight where I will place my ones. And once that is done, I will choose three out of the remaining six to place my fives. And this part will be the same. Now, numerically, uh, these numbers would change. I mean, this one will be remain the same, but instead of eight choose three times five choose two, I will have eight choose two for choosing ones, times six choose three, because I will have remaining six places and I will again choose three of them to be filled out with fives. But these happen to be the same. And again, that's not a coincidence. It has to be, right? Because like why this process is fixed in stone? No, it can be, for example, reversed. So it's clearly that this uh, product of two choose Yes, that eight choose three times five choose two must be the same as eight choose two times six choose three. But uh, it's a more general rule than that. So basically, uh, um, a product of consecutive n choose choose n my n one and one choose n two uh, times well something related to the previous, namely difference between them is here choose something else and if i continue this it doesn't matter how i do it the only thing really matters is the beginning and the end um okay and it doesn't matter the order okay we'll come back to that uh so how many ways are there uh to uh, someone is asking what is Z, uh, what do I have, oh, Z, oh, Z, integers, yeah, so Z10 is this set, oh, so Z is integers, Z10 is residues mod 10, right, so it's this set, yeah, Z2 is bits, 0, 1, yeah, ZB is, um, all the uh, digits base B. Okay. Uh, how many ways are there to distribute 10 identical prices to 275 people? Uh, but you uh, have a constraint to at most one per person. So now, uh, oh, sorry, the, the people are students. Uh, so the people are different, uh, but the prices are all identical. So, okay, what am I choosing? Am I choosing prices or am I choosing people? Which, which of these, you know, what kind of object is it convenient to think of? Well, um, it's, you're choosing people. You're choosing a set of 10 people among this 275 uh, that you're going to mark. And these are the ones who are going to uh, get a prize. So it's a number of 10 element subsets. 
and it's unordered because the prices are identical. Okay, so so th like whether you know what was corresponding to what? I mean, perhaps you can think of this as a, some other correspondence. But here is a convenient way to to think of this, which gets you an answer. Um, now, what would change if you said that the prices are different? Uh, well, so this is just uh, so now it's it's not an unordered set of ten. It's a set of ten, but ordered. In other words, it's a sequence of size n, of size ten. Right, so it's a ten permutation out of this set, right? So whether the prices were the same or whether they were different, given this constraint, that it was at most one per person, uh, basically switched the process from either choosing a subset, in the case where the price was all the same, so it was just a binary thing, you either in it. Or you're out. Yes? And if the prices were different, so there's the semantics of the first, second, third, then it becomes a sequence that you're choosing. Um, so we have, um, so these are just two cases, right, which we just answered. And they basically were, they, were, they had both a constraint of at most one per person. Uh, but they differed by whether the prices were the same, you know, was all that mattered is the set, or different, in which case it mattered what the ordering was. And now what if you remove this constraint? Um, yes. Um, so, um, what if you remove this constraint? Uh, well, it's this even simpler answer, right? So each of these, uh, each selection basically is a sequence of 10 without constraints. So it could be that they are repeated. So every sequence of 10, 10 elements uh, of length 10, where individual characters are in this alphabet of 275, chosen from this alphabet, and every string uh, counts. So if you choose the same character, the same person at every index, it's still fine. Uh, by the way, somebody asks if we, we need a calculator on this type of exam, right, on these questions. So uh, as I was saying in the uh, big preamble to the homework, uh, no. And in fact, you, I'm asking you to not evaluate this numerically, essentially ever in this class, right? I mean, so occasionally I would ask you explicitly, okay, so now see what this evaluates for, but that's an exception, not the rule. And I'm listening in the homework like of many reasons why this makes sense and it's better for you, better for us, better for everybody. Do not evaluate this. Um, well, of course you can evaluate, right? It's like, uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, it, 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 it's, it's not, it makes no sense to do so in this class, except on the occasional time when you're curious of how, you know, what, how big these numbers are, uh, right? Um, like, let's say you wanted to compare these two, okay? Or, or this, numerically. Okay, so this is not what we do right now, but you could ask this question and uh, of course uh, then you evaluate these, but that's not the questions we will be asking you, um, except of one on this homework. Okay. Um, so, um, okay. It seems like we have some, you know, types of these processes and uh, we already know how to answer uh, this kind of process, the different process types. Okay, let's try to use this for um, uh, playing poker. And basically this is the time where we should end.
but I guess that there's no real difference between me keeping some of you versus just recording an extra and placing it on YouTube, right? So I might as well continue. Maybe we'll just take like a minute break. You now, if there's somebody who needs to go and w wants to ask some question. Are we allowed to ask homework questions? Um, yeah, so do you need to go or would you, could you keep to the end of the lecture? How long is the end of the lecture going to be? Well, I think we started like about half hour late. So we're going to go till 2.30? Yeah, no, 2.15, I think. 2.15, okay. Okay, so we, we continue. Um, okay. Um, so here is a bunch of uh, good uh, places where we can train on ways of counting things. Uh, it's a hazard game, it's poker, and uh, many questions will be like this. So we, we basically need to learn this vocabulary um, just so that you can, we can see, can you count these things or can you not? Okay, so, um, um, okay. So for people who play cards, this is all repeat, but for those who, who don't or play them in other language, as was uh, my case mostly, um, you need to learn this vocabulary. So uh, cards is a deck of cards, 52 cards, um, in 13 different ranks, ace, and then there is no one, but it's two to 10, and then jack, queen, and king. And each such set of 13 comes in four different suit, suits. Um, diamond, heart, club, suit, uh, spade. Okay, that's the English names for these. And um, um, and, and um, yeah, post on the other if you will like, uh, I, I wonder how many um, languages you know use these uh, i mean we probably um, it's less than the languages we speak right that we probably repeat uh, these names across languages i know that in polish is taken from from french for example um okay or, or from italian actually okay that's one thing about. each card has a rank and a suit right so each car card has both a rank and a suit and it's a unique so in a deck of cards, there's a single uh, eight of uh, diamonds. Or at least there should, right? Unless you, you play with uh, uh, Groucho Marx or something, uh, who has uh, many aces of spades. Uh, every rank and suit combination is possible. Uh, so the number of cards is simply a product of 13 times 4. Yes. OK. Now, in a poker, you, uh, you're dealt a hand, which is five cards. And the order does not matter, right? So you can rearrange uh, cards in your hand. So it's not the ordering of them that matters, it's a subset. So the first thing is like, how many different hands are there? Five card hands. Well, it's a five element subset of the set of 52, and order doesn't matter. So it's 52 to 5, All right? That's how many, if, uh, if the deck is perfectly shuffled, you're going to get one of them with equal probability. Uh, now let's add some specific, put some constraints. So how many of these five card hands have exactly three club cards? So suit three. So, you're choosing five and they are unordered, but now you have this constraint that three of them have to be clubs. So in other words, three of them are chosen from the three 13 element set, all clubs, and the remaining two are chosen from all the other suits, right? So it's uh, three times 13, right? So 39 remaining. And um, so how many ways of getting now, now within the club, right? So three of them are clubs, but you're not told which. Any three clubs work. So there is 13 choose three ways of choosing uh, three clubs. 
and uh, there is 39 times 2 of all the others, right? So now the, by the product rule and the fact that these two are independent processes, right? So if one person was given all those clubs and they, and they shuffled them and the other or the remaining cards, they basically could independently choose, uh, you know, this part and this part, right? So, so this is uh, this is the product rule, and this is the total number. Now, okay, what about? So, here I had three of a given suit, okay, fixed suit clubs. Uh, here I have this is a poker figure called three of a kind. It means that three of your cards have the same rank. Like for example, three aces or three fives, or three tens, or three jacks. The remaining two uh, have constraints. None of them is equal to this kind that you have a three, because if you have four of the same, it's not called three of a kind, it's called four. I mean, I forgot what the poker name of it is, but basically four is not a three of a kind. It's not called that way. So, so these remaining two are not equal to these. And moreover, they are also not equal to each other because that has this, uh, another poker name. If you have a three and a two, that's a different figure in poker. It's not like super important that that is the case, okay? Like, right? It's just that um, we will specify these constraints every time, but you know, you might not read them quick or parse this very quick. So you should be aware that these constraints are there, that uh, we will give them to you, but like you should just get attuned to that, that three of a kind means just three same and the other two are not one of those and they're so different from each other. Okay, so now you count them. Okay, well, let's, you can structure this in different ways, but let's structure this as this following. First of all, choose the rank that will determine the rank of this three of a kind car. Now, does this, what else remains to be determined? Well, the suit of these three, of these three cards, because they could be diamond heart club or it could be diamond heart spade, or it could be, you know, club diamond spade, whatever, right? So the suits of these, and then the remaining two cards have to be chosen. Now these processes are independent, right? It could be three different people who are asked to do this, except, well, this person says the remaining, the other ranks, but do they really have to be told what ranks? No, they can order them from first to 12, because with one chosen, there's 12 remaining. And they can give you their choice as the number. Now, this choice and this choice will determine this card, uh, this card uniquely. In that sense, it's an independent decision. In that sense, you can count these independently, and you can count these independently, and then by product rule, it will determine, right? The fact that this choice of suit is really completely independent of these two is sort of more obvious, right? So uh, all we need now is to count these three independently. Okay, let's do so. So first of all, choose the rank that will determine. Well, that's an easy thing, right? Because there's one out of 13 choices. There's 13, choose one. Now choose the suit of the three cards. There's four suits and we have to choose three of them. It's four choose three. It's unordered because, um, you know, whether I choose diamonds, hard clubs or clubs, uh, hard diamonds, it's the same three, right? Uh, cards together with this choice of the rank. And now choose the remaining cards from the other ranks. Well, what are the remaining cards? I have to discard not just three cards of this rank that I chose, I have to discard all cards from this rank, which is four of them. So the remaining ranks are 12 ranks, 
and any suit goes, so it's 12 times 4, and that's the same as 52 minus 4. And I chose two of them, right? So that's my final answer. And here you can see clearly that if you start evaluating these things numerically, you know, when you give us this answer, and let's say you made a mistake, like instead of choosing two of the 48, you're choosing three. Well, we have no idea why you did it, uh, but uh, maybe there was something in this statement, I don't know, maybe it was like an easy kind of mistake that you confuse this part with this part or something. At least we know that you have made these parts correct and you have identified this process as an independent tree. If you gave us the numerical answer, we have no clue what's happening. So if it's exactly identical to the right one, okay, well, we can check, uh, but, uh, but that's one of the reasons not to not to give us answers in the numerical form. Um, okay. How many five cards have two pairs? Now the two pairs again, it's uh, two pairs is a poker figure. It means you have two doubles, right? Uh, two cards of one rank and two cards of some other rank, and these two ranks are different because otherwise you would have four cards of the same rank. And the fifth card is not matching either of these two uh, of which you have the double, right? So choose the rank of these two. So now what's the process? Choose the rank of these two pairs. Uh, choose two suits. First, uh, choose the two cards. Ah. And now it's an issue. So, and naturally you would say, well, choose the two suits for these two ranks. But if you don't do this correctly, you will have a problem with overcounting. And choose the remaining cards from the other ranks. Okay, that's the non controversial. Um, uh, here I choose two suits, okay, and I will, when I think of these two processes as independent, in other words, one can be done by one student and the two can be done by another student independently. And when they come together, they will define a unique choice and they will not, like some choices of this and some choices of this are not never going to identify the same overall choice. The way to do this is that you choose these two suits, but basically it's an ordered choice. The first choice determines the rank, and how do you tell which of these two? You know, if these ranks are chosen by one student in one room, and these suits are chosen by another student in a different room, then let's say this chooses suits, okay, this is my first suit, is clubs, and the second is diamonds. Well, this other student chose two ranks. Which one was the first and which one was the second? Because if he chose two ranks as jacks, eights, or if he chose it as eights, jacks, how do these suits now should correspond? You see, there is a possibility of if you are both counting of this, this as order and counting this as ordered, then you will be overcounting. Uh, you will count twice as many. So one way to do this is that the first suit will define the suit of the lower of the two ranks chosen by the other student, and the second will choose the, uh, the suit of the higher. Okay, so okay. So this guy chooses two ranks, so it's two choices out of 13, so it's 13 choose two. And the other person chooses two suits. And well, so uh, the choice of suit of the two cards in the lower two of these two ranks is four choose two, right? There's two cards and how many suits are possible? Four. So there's four choose two ways of choosing suits for these two cards. 
and the other, the higher ranking ones, uh, it's the same. In fact, these are really not uh, dependent process. So you can even give it this two, it's really two A and two B. And this could be given to two different students again, the, who do not have to communicate. One of them chooses the, the suits of the lower ranked pair and the other chooses the suits of the higher ranked pair. They don't need to talk. Uh, choose the remaining cards. Well, that's easy, right? I just keep, well, it's not exactly easy. You can still make a mistake here. For example, you can just kick out only these two cards that are chosen, right? So the two yeah, in one uh, double and two in the other, right? No, you should kick out eight cards. You should call, kick out all cards with this chosen rank and all cards with this chosen rank. So eight in total. And then it's a product rule, right? Uh, if uh, the, there could be other ways to 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 um, to make these choices, um, but somehow fundamentally they must come out to the same. And. Um, um, these two ranks are unordered. So whether I'm choosing jacks or eights, jacks and eights, or eights and jacks, it's the same. And an alternative way to think of this would be to think of this process as choosing a ordered pair, right? And of these people split as this student chooses whatever the suits were of the first chosen here and the other student chooses to call the suits of the whatever was chosen as a second but you will be overcounting in that case because if this guy chooses jacks and eights then uh, then these two choices will um anyway if he chooses jacks and eights versus eights and jacks uh these the three of them will determine the same four cards in two different ways, which means that you're overcounting. The way to stop overcounting is to divide by two, which is exactly the difference between the number of ordered such pairs and unordered ones. So then you don't have to do any adjustments once you chose them in this way, right? Uh, that's the most uh, complex case uh, of, of all that we, uh, we will have here. Um, okay, uh, how many five card hands have no face cards? So face card is an ace, jack, queen, and king. Uh, they have painted faces and the other cards have just numbers on them. So that's, uh, it's just a reduced set, right? You kick out all the um, character face cards uh, so there's four times four of them and the remaining is four times nine. Yeah, so that's the number of choices. Uh, here is one more. Uh, a club has 10 men and nine women. Uh, how many ways are there to select a committee of six people from the club? Okay, so it has just 19 people and you choose six out of them. So it's 19 to six. But let's now take gender into you know account and say I need the same number of men and women. Okay, so now I basically split this partition, this set into two different subsets, right? The men and the nine and the women, and do independent uh, choices. And uh, and so I choose three out of the nine women and I choose three out of the nine ten men. Okay, uh, uh, simple. And here is a new topic, you know, so um, let's just stop here. Yes, and I'll uh, continue from, from this point in the, in the next one. Oh, hello, Professor. Yes. Ace is not a face card, is it? Well, okay, you know what? <laughs> uh, I thought it was. Uh, if you tell me no, then that's fine. Mm, so yeah, I shouldn't be picking it on it, but no, still. no, no, that's cool, that's cool. Uh, 
you're right yes yes uh, i mean mouse yes right it's it's uh, you're totally right yes uh, they don't have faces so i don't know maybe zybox treats uh, asus as a face card um i've had this example for years and i didn't think of it really yeah uh, because if it shows up on the test you know i might get you know questioned <laughs> Oh, something yes. Like this. Uh, yeah. yes. No, 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 no. So the, the thing on the test is that, you know, we'll always define these things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I've seen ACES with like a face on it, but no, most but of them yeah. don't. Right. Yeah. Like it's, it's not a standard way. Right. Yes. Um, uh, ACES is not face. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, other questions? Um, th this one, this one really um, um, messes with people uh, every time. So just think of this: what would happen if you if you thought of these as ordered, and then how would you determine use the independent choices of these to basically partition the, to have the following property that every choice these four processes make determines a unique uh, final choice and there is no two ways that this can go which will determine the same outcome because if there is then uh, you know then this product will not be a correct way right uh, and um, and you have an issue when you do uh, an unordered set or yeah an an ordered or uh, if you choose these two in an ordered way and you interpret this choice as as the suit of the first of these ordered ones and these as a suit of the second of the ordered one. Any other questions? Um, can we ask homework questions? So. Hello, hello. Yes, you were allowed to ask homework questions, right? Yes. 